I think we are ready to start. Yes, my name is Ingibjörg Ólu Vilhjámsdóttir. Um, I go by the nickname of Inga Loa, which is probably easier for el everyone here. I am uh, working currently at the EFTA Surveillance Authority in Brussels, uh, in the legal department, but having been in the legal profession now for over 23 years, I've been uh, both in the public and the private sector. And um, so I will draw a little bit from my experience, uh, both as an Icelander and as a very interested um, participant in empowering women. Uh, I will start by going into back to basics, so to say, um, and present fintech and sustainable finance. Uh, I will go into the history. I will um, go into the negativities of fintech and, of course, also the positive sides. And I couldn't resist to touch up on the World Economic Forum Index, uh, as Iceland has um, been in the first place there for quite some years. But at the same time, we have a lot to do. So let's start this. Well, you all know what uh, financial technology encompasses. Um, Internet uh, of um, Internet of Things, uh, big data, blockchain and artificial intelligence are now omnipresent in our life, uh, lives and lifestyles. Uh, but what is sustainable finance and what does it really mean? Because we are talking about it, it's a fancy word, but uh, what does it encompass? If I just take a definition from the Swiss sustainable finance, uh, it is... With, uh, defined as any form of financial services integrating environmental, social and governance criteria into the business or investment decisions for the lasting benefit of both clients and society at large, including sustainable funds, green bonds, impact investing, microfinance, active ownership, credits for sustainable projects, and development of the whole financial system in a more sustainable way. If we look at the history of fintech, it's of course not a new, uh, it's not a new concept, but it dates back to 1950s, or some would even say much further back, and uh, they would say up, uh, back to 1860 with the pathograph uh, invented by Giovanni Gazzelli. Well, what most of us uh, know, though, is that uh, the Diners Club launched its first credit card in the 1950s. The first ATM was launched by Barclays in 67. Nasdaq was established in uh, 71. And if we jump into the near future, or the near, <laughs> near past, it's uh, the release of Bitcoin was 2009, and Google Pay sent 2011, and now things are changing rapidly. Things are changing so fast that uh, we don't really know what is happening out there. When talking about nowadays, uh, this is a picture from 2017. We have 5.15 billion people with mobile devices worldwide, and still there are over 1.7 billion adults that are unbanked. And 56% uh, of the unbanked populations, population are women. With fintech, uh, it's going to be possible for these people to gain more financial autonomy. And it's worth noting that mobile-based payment schemes have a great impact in countries where the share of people owning a current account at a, small, uh, at a, at a bank is small. For instances, like Natalia will touch up on later on here today, 
countries like Africa, where only one in four people has a bank account, but according to The Economist, mo many more have access to a mobile phone. And they are becoming testing grounds for new payment systems, as well as for loans for customers with little credit history. So it's enabling women and, uh, and people with uh, maybe not even access to bank accounts to, uh, to uh, get access to payments. If we go back to the basics, and now we are talking about sustainability. Sustainability dates back to 1700s. And uh, we can pick out, to just to pick out a few here, we can talk about the um, Leakius of, Na of Nations that was created in 1920s. The International Label Organization adopts first six international label conventions. No, we jump to uh, 1963. The Equal Pay Act is passed in the US. Prohibiting wage discrimination between men and women. 72. Stockholm Declaration leads to the establishment of the United Nations Environmental Programme. 1992. Rio Earth Summit. 1997. The Kyoto Protocol. And, uh, and then we go to 2015, where the Paris Climate Agreement sets the global, the global goal of limiting global warming to below 2%. This is uh, FinTech and sustainability are the two major drivers of change in the financial sector through disruptive innovation. What is disruptive innovation? In business theory, it is an innovation that creates a new market and value network and eventually disrupts an existing market and value network, displacing established market-leading firms, products and alliances. Well, if we now go into the dangers or the negative impacts of fintech, uh, I can, of course, not repeat the horrible things that we saw here earlier on regarding all the um, cyber attack and the cyber crimes and uh, the, uh, the, the child pornography and, and all these things because they are beyond horror. They are just absolutely disgusting. But privacy is a big thing. And uh, in the EU, we have all the GDPR regulations and, and we are much more regulated in the Western society. And that could, that could uh, hamper or it could actually um, be detrimental to development of innovation in certain way. So we have to find a balance. We have to find the balance between over-regulating and under-regulating. It's, it's, it's a very thin line and it's difficult to find that, find that balance. Well, we can talk about energy consumption. It's very energy uh, intensive uh, to use all this technology. Artificial intelligent, uh, intelligence. Uh, there we will uh, see a lot of people losing their jobs. And then we, of course, we have uh, some scams, fraud, due to lacking of regulation or cyber attacks, etc. Uh, regarding gender bias, only approximately 22% of uh, artificial intelligence professionals uh, globally are women. And this accounts for 70%, 72% gap. And this is worrisome because uh, if all the majority of artificial engineers and programmers are male, we already have a bias in the programs. And how are we going to correct that? And that is something that we really have to act upon now. Because we will not go back in 50 years and say, OK, yeah, this machine, it was uh, developed by a guy. Uh, let's now make it gender neutral. We have to do this now, and, and to do this, we need more women in this industry. 
and uh, consequently the bi baseline yeah it's going to be gender bias towards women and this is based on uh, the world economic forum uh, global gender gap report no the deepening of the digital gap it's uh, there is a thin balance between bridging the gap and deepening the digital gap because this could result in alienating people that uh, lack the necessary infrastructure. And that is a big problem as well. Well, benefits of fintech, uh, of course, they are, they are a, <laughs> a lot of, there are lots of benefits. And, uh, and they are empowering people um, because of inst the inst instinctive, easy to use, and it's easy to access. It's very easy to get the application and just to pay online and to do all your banking online and, uh, and all these things that uh, help you even with crowdfunding and, and, and things like that. Um, when it comes to uh, the bridging the gap, uh, a parallel note can be made on the gender gap. Overall, the gender gap has been reduced and this is shocking actually. It's 0.03% over the last year and only 3.6% since 2006. Based on these numbers, it will take us 108 years to gender parity. 108 years. We just don't have that time. But fintech can, if it's used in the right way, we can use fintech to, to help us. And, and to do that, we need to have the awareness, we need to get women into the business, we need to make the men that are already working in the business aware of how this can be ratified. And... Uh, Talking about women that uh, don't have um, access to their financials or don't even have their own bank accounts. Uh, some women in some countries, they are not allowed to own property or inherit it. And they are not even allowed to have an IT card. So fintech can help in this instance. Well, when we are cutting out, uh, well, we of course, strength, uh, strength by the mass, peer-to-peer uh, -peer collective efforts. This can be reflected in pooling of resources, such as crowdfunding, as I mentioned earlier, to open horizon for disruptive innovation and new product offerings. Well, FinTech also cut out the middlemen with less cost involved in transactions. And uh, if we just think about uh, the, let's say 10, 15 years ago, money transfers, Traditionally, you would ask your bank to send money to someone and they would char charge you fees and transfer fees and intermediary fees and so on. But now you can do this without any of these costs. Well, if we just, because I couldn't resist, I had to talk about uh, Iceland <laughs> in the end, uh, because even though uh, we are talking about fintech and sustainability. Uh, Iceland has been on the top of the list of the World Economic Forum for nine years in a row. And we have almost managed to, to bridge the gap, so to say. We are 85% towards the gap. However, despite having a, a prime minister that is female, a um, bishop that is female, uh, we have a lot of women in the parliament, we have lots of women in the municipalities, we are lacking women in the highest position in the private companies that take important decisions that affect the economy. And that's where we need to step up. And if I just think about that Iceland is on top of the list, and this is still going on there, it worries me. It really worries me, but at the same time, I would like to use the words of uh, the woman that was played out on the video just before, Michelle uh, Bachelet, yeah, and she said, it's time for women. And by these, uh, th by, uh, like, 
just to end this, I would like to uh, introduce my next speaker, Natalia Sanchez, which is a CEO and, and founder of Keeley Partners. Natalia has lived and worked in more than 15 countries, and she has extensive experience in emerging markets in Africa, Eurasia, and Latin America. She has met hundreds of policymakers and business leaders for the production of investment reports published in Fortune magazine, Business Week, Bloomberg, Oxford Business Group, and other international media. She has a wide understanding of growth opportunities in different markets and industries. Natalia has also, also consults for Latin American diplomatic corps and for European, African, and Latin American companies wanting to invest, trade, or establish businesses' relations across regions. She is a founder and a managing partner of the Africa advisory and project development firm Keeley Partners, a member of the Institute of Directors of South Africa, and a member of the Institute of Business, Business Advisors of South Africa. She is also part of the Global Leadership Academy of the GIZ. And last but not least, she speaks Spanish, English, French, Portuguese, Italian, and German. And she is currently learning Mandarin. <laughs> so please welcome, <laughs> welcome my fellow speaker, Natalia. Would you like to have the... Thank you very much for being here today. I'm very excited to, to be with all of you uh, talking about a, a subject that I'm very passionate about, and this is fintech in Africa. And why is it so important or, or, or fascinating? It's because of the impact that fintech has in Africa. The, you will see now the scale of the challenge in Africa, the scale of the problem, and at the same time, the scale of the opportunity and the scale of the impact. And this is why it's so fascinating and so important and so important for us to get it right. Um, in Africa, fintech is not about bringing your latte more efficiently. It's really about uh, creating uh, these fintech companies are not really disruptive companies because to be disruptive means that you are replacing existing systems and existing infrastructure, which in many cases in Africa, they just don't exist. So the fintechs, what they are doing is in many cases creating from scratch, building these infrastructures from scratch and bringing financial choices to millions of people for the first time. So this is uh, why it's so exciting. I'm going to play a little video for you.
Yes, that's Jumo, a company. Uh, we'll talk about this company shortly. Um, let me come here first. Right. Whoop. I don't know what happened. Mm. Right? Oh, okay, I know, I know, I know. Opportunity to earn an yes. income with a seamless integration service through a smart and easy... Hmm. I think I need help with my tech. <laughs> Let's see. This one this slide bigger. Oh, okay. Looks different. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, for us to understand the, the scale that we were talking about, uh, let's understand the true size of Africa. So, Africa is a continent where you can feed Spain, Portugal, Belgium, Netherlands, France, Germany, Italy, the United States, China, Eastern Europe, India, Japan, and the UK. That's the scale, that's the size of Africa. So anything that happens in Africa happens in a bigger scale. And this is why it's so important that we get it right. On top of everything, um, Africa has experienced very rapid and very high economic growth. Six of the ten fastest growing economies in the world are in Africa. There's so much economic activity, there is so much happening there. And this is why you have the need of so much infrastructure, so much expertise, know-how, products and services. Ethiopia, for instance, it's at the stage where China was in the 70s. Very, very clear industrialization plan, uh, a lot of privatization. The biggest telecom, um, the Africa, uh, Ethiopia Telecom, it's being uh, privatized at the moment, is one of the last biggest opportunities and markets that are being opened, 100 million people. So let's understand some fundamentals. Africa now has, a lot of them have to, have to do with the demographics. Africa now has a population of 1.2 billion people that is expected to double to 2 billion uh, by 50, uh, 2050. So that is in 30 years, twice. And brace yourself for this one because I think it's one of the most stunning statistics that you will hear. By the year 2100, 40% of people on Earth will be African. 40%. So I'm going to let just that sink in. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm talking about when I say it's so important it's our collect in our collective interest that we get things right in Africa. It's a very young continent. 60% of the population is under 25 years old. So a lot of people that are entering the, you know, the, uh, as consumers uh, are starting their economic activity, are um, looking for jobs or working. And 22% of Africa's working age population actually are starting new businesses. So imagine as well what that means in terms of the financial needs of so many entrepreneurs. SMEs are uh, the largest providers of the formal sector jobs in South Africa. Again, imagine what that means for financial choices for entrepreneurs. 29 million youths join Africa's labor, uh, labor force, uh, be have been joining the labor force between 2015 and 2030. Again, a lot of uh, activity in the, in the job market, I a lot of economic activity. And so all this demographic growth, all this urbanization, young population, and fast-growing middle class um, are also creating 500 million new consumers in the next 10 years. Imagine all those needs for everything that you have in the continent. Infrastructure, uh, housing, transport, goods and services. So it's a tremendous opportunity, but it's also a challenge. You also need healthcare, you need education. And despite all of this, 66% of sub-Saharan African adult population is unbanked. It's unbelievable. And Africa has the lowest bank branch penetration, so five branches only for 100,000 people, compared to uh, 32 in North America, uh, 17 in Latin America and the Middle East, and 13 in Emerging Asia. 
So now you can start understanding and putting the pieces together. No banks, no infrastructure, so many people, so much happening. That's the need that they have. Business and individuals like access to credit, savings and affordable financial services. Entrepreneurs, they also lack investment capital. Um, because they have little or no collateral, collateral security. Uh, Ingaloa mentioned uh, as well that there's still a lack of uh, even people ha not having IDs. So how can you even do so, so much of your transactions or your daily uh, life and business without, without an ID? Um, but people have um, mobile phones and there's a high mobile penetration of 47% with mobile phone connections that will exceed 1 billion in just five years from now. And this is the fertile ground where fintech has been able to flourish in Africa. From 30 uh, fintechs in 2007 to over 262 last year, um, and they are, they are growing. So today there are 100 million active financial mobile services uh, customers in Africa uh, conducting transactions uh, worth 2.1 billion. 260 active uh, fintech companies in Africa, 80% are uh, local, 20% international, and they are growing at an annual rate of 24%. The payment segment is the most dominant, and we will see now why. So these are some of the uh, fintech hubs in Africa. So we have a, a, a representation, this is Sub-Saharan Africa, so Kenya in the east, Nigeria in the west, and Southern Africa uh, in the south. So these three countries actually uh, have the largest um, activity in fintech, and you will see that they are also quite different between each other. So. Uh, South Africa, which is the most sophisticated uh, co country in many ways, they actually have um, a largest uh, percentage of enabling process and technology. They also, you will see that they also have, for, for instance, technology for property. Um, they have rec tech, whereas in other countries where, to your point, uh, people don't have uh, access to property, uh, this is still lacking. The payment sector is the most dominant because people need to do transactions, they need to do payments. And one cannot talk about, I think, uh, fintech in Africa without getting to know a company, uh, M-Pesa, uh, a service called M-Pesa. I don't know if you're familiar with M-Pesa, any of you? No? Okay. <laughs> I brought Richard Quest to talk to us about M-Pesa. Um, Long before Apple Pay or Venmo launched in the US, years before WeChat and Alipay took over China, mobile banking got started right here in Nairobi. Mpesa was created in 2007. Its service is simple. Money is sent back and forth like a text message. Transfers can be made and received on even the most basic phones. And you don't need a bank account. Do you use it every day? Oh, yes, every day. It's easy. In 10 years, it's evolved from a simple money transfer service to a fully-fledged financial platform. It offers savings and loans. It even sells insurance. Do you take Mpesa? Yeah. Yeah, of course they do. Mpesa. Mpesa, you can accept. Ah, now this is the real test. Can I buy newspapers using Mpesa? Never mind American Express, Visa, or MasterCard. It's Mpesa. There are only 2,000 ATMs in Kenya. Compare that with 120,000 Mpesa agents. Places where Kenyans can withdraw or deposit cash in exchange for virtual and better currency. Is this the sort of place that I can give money to charge my Mpesa? Yes. And I do that with you? Yes. And is this the sort of place where I can then come to and get money from Mpesa? Yes. yes. Believe it or not, I can do more mobile banking here in Kenya than I can 
in New York City or London. If you're getting the idea, it doesn't matter what you're buying, mobile banking now is the heart of the payment system in East Africa. You get the idea. 93% of the population has access to mobile payments. In fact, transactions processed by platforms like Mbisa account for nearly half of Kenya's entire GDP. I've never quite seen a revolution in, in payment systems like it. Forget PayPal or Venmo, this is going right to the grassroots here. Everybody takes Mbisa. That's what you call marketing and mobile banking. That's right. Mobile money started in Kenya. So, and it's, it's important for also for the rest of what we will see. I love uh, how uh, Richard Quest is so impressed by, oh, you're taking pesa, you're taking pesa. And people are like, yeah, we take mobile money. Where'd you come from? <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite impressive. Um, that's in pesa. Uh, uh, as you saw, it was launched in 2007. And, uh, but now it processes almost 50% of Kenya's GDP. Isn't that impressive? So imagine like Telefonica here in Spain processing 50% of Spain's GDP. So that's what's actually happen happening in Kenya. And it has really helped to increase financial inclusion. Uh, financial inclusion in Kenya was 27% in 2006. And uh, today is 83%. So you can see the impact. Uh, People have access to M-Pesa, they can transact. Um, they have 37 million active customers. Uh, they carry over 11 billion transactions, and that is 500 transactions every second. And now, of course, they have, um, you know, expand to other countries. Uh, they tried to come to South Africa, but it didn't work out because actually South Africa is uh, a country where we do have a very strong financial uh, banking sector. The banking sector in South Africa is um, many times um, ranked by the World Economic Forum as only second in the world, between second and third in the world in terms of sophistication. So it's, um, South Africa has other challenges, which we will see now. So now, talking about Jumo, that's the video that we saw at the beginning, so what Jumo has done really is to use uh, data analytics to um, increase the uh, eligibility of many, many people so that they can have access to loans and have access to savings and financial products. If you see the banks, the eligibility, it's just m less than 5% of the people, whereas Jumo stands at 50% and is increasing. So how do they do this? Actually, they work with an ecosystem of partners. These partners mainly are the telcos, so the, uh, the mobile companies. And what they do is uh, taking all of the data that the telcos have to understand the behavior of people. So how much airtime do they buy? Uh, if they, how much they, do they charge? And so on. So they, they understand the profile of, the, of these customers. They partner as well with the financial institutions so that the financial institutions then can understand the behavior of so many people and then can offer uh, financial services. So it's not that the banks really don't want or, haven't, uh, or didn't want to in the past, it's that they just didn't understand that sector of the population. And it was too expensive and, and difficult to actually try to understand them. But now with technology, you can put all of this together and people then have access to all these financial choices. You saw that the, the loans, they are for as little as $1, $2. And this means that over 14 million people and small businesses are being served, 1 billion in funds dispersed, um, in, uh, five times increased uh, in data prediction and accuracy, accuracy, 51 million interactions with customers each month. Uh, a lot of them are entrepreneurs as well. And they are also expanding to many, many markets, uh, including India, Bangladesh, also uh, coming up in the future. Now I want to talk to you about another company that is doing great things, and this time this is in South Africa, where the, as I mentioned to you, the environment is a little bit different. We're for the entrepreneurs who are taking risks and putting their ideas and ideals out into the world. The ones who work 60 hour weeks and employ 60% of the country. We need them and they need more. 
This is why we're focused on enabling all businesses in all their different shapes, categories, and sizes to overcome the barriers to success. To get money in the bank to make that sale. But entrepreneurs still deserve more, so we're bringing them the new Yoko Point of Sale to help them run smarter, faster, and more seamless businesses. They can now organize the products and get set up for success. Delight the customers with fast, smooth checkout. Track their sales, learn what works, and grow. Welcome to Yoko. Payments and point of sale. Okay, so this is Yoko in South Africa, where we have an employment rate of 30%. Uh, at the same time, we have a very sophisticated banking sector. And uh, so entrepreneurs are pretty important for, for the economy. As you saw, 60% of, uh, of employment comes from small businesses. And, but entrepreneurs haven't been served. So the, these big banks that are so sophisticated, they have also focused on a sector of the population and haven't done much for entrepreneurs. So the choices that as an entrepreneur you have in South Africa are very, very thin. So what Joko came up with is a um, device that you could connect to your mobile phone and by doing that accept credit cards. Because for a small business to be able to accept credit cards, the, uh, ad the, the, the admin that they have to do is very long, it's quite expensive, so most of them they just didn't have facilities to accept credit cards. So with Joko, with a very easy device, you connect to your phone, you can accept credit cards, and that's how many, many uh, businesses have been able to accept payments. But the great thing with these businesses is that they go further. The more that you start doing and understanding your customers and getting more data and understand what else can you do for them. So now Yoko, what they are doing is they can have created Yoko Capital because now they understand their customers. They can also offer them uh, capital. They can offer them loans. So how does this, this work? So after three months that you sign up with them and you have a monthly turnover of about, what is that, like 90 euros? Um, you have more than 10 monthly transactions. So then you they start building your profile and then you, you can apply for a loan. You receive a decision in seconds. So it's not like in a bank where like it takes forever to take a, de uh, take a decision. So you receive a decision in seconds, you get your money and then because Yoko understands when your money is coming in, they will just take the payment, not like at the end of the month, like no matter what that payment, they will take it every day if you make the sales. The day that you don't make sales, they don't take any money. So it goes with the, final, uh, with the cycle of the company and that is a great help for entrepreneurs. So uh, they, launched, they launched just four years ago. Uh, they were working only with five companies, but now they uh, process payments of about 408 million annually. 70% of the merchants haven't accepted um, cards before. So th imagine that. And, and many of them say that they were losing up to 70% of sales because they didn't have this card facility. 70%, that's huge. So now Joko Capital, the one making the loans, they have given about $3.7 million um, dollars lo uh, worth in loans, and only 2% of loans have defaulted. That means that their accuracy, it's, it's, so, it, it's, it's fantastic. Banks generally will leave all these entrepreneurs aside, like they wouldn't bother. But Joko has proven actually that if you have the right product, if you understand entrepreneurs, you can really help them. And this also helps because these entrepreneurs, instead of taking the money in cash, now they take it and it's digitized and this formalizes the economy as well. Now they can pay also taxes. Now like there is more register of what money is coming in. They become taxpayers. Everything's more formalized. So like the whole system just becomes better. So all in all, I just want to say quickly uh, something about Africa tech in general, because like innovations are happening in fintech. There's a lot of exciting things happening in e-health, e-education, uh, technology for logistics, and so many other areas. So Africa actually is a very exciting place full of innovation where people are coming up with solutions to really big and real problems. And 
th there's a 442 active hubs and accelerators across the continent, so you can understand how dynami dynamic the scene is. Uh, there's interest from uh, you know big companies from Google, Uber, Alibaba, and Microsoft that want to invest, that want to partner with, that want to be part of this. Uh, VCs and international finance institutions as well participating in in, in this uh, ecosystem. And African tech startups, uh, yes, uh, last year this was big news, that they have raised last year 1.2 billion. Uh, and this was great because just one year before it was half of that, and the year before was even less. So it is happening. Uh, also, the, the number of large venture growth deals increasing 100% um, year on year. So it's uh, a lot of reasons to be optimistic about. Uh, but let's think about as well if it's really, uh, is, is it a tech boom, really? If we look at the big picture, we can see that there's a lack of meaningful scale and diversity. A lot of this happens in those three hubs that we talk about, so Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. Uh, so not, or much less happening in the, in the rest of the continent. And if you also see the 1.2 billion that we are talking about represents only 0.4% of all the uh, of the global venture capital funding uh, which is stands at 293 billion so it, it's really a drop in the ocean um, and fintech attracts also 50 percent of total funding so other type of st types of technologies are not that well founded yet so again the, the big picture is to um, to be positive and excited and proud about all these developments and to keep on you know, believing in them and, and participating, but also to understand that a fintech or any kind of tech for that matter cannot solve Africa's challenges on their own. So Africa needs to uh, tackle wider development, uh, development, development problems. Uh, internet access remains the lowest globally and that's where we see the digital divide. Data cost, uh, data is very expensive in Africa. It's the most expensive in the whole world. People have to spend a large part of their income just in data. African economies remain uh, the least competitive in the world. So there is uh, a lot of obstacles for business and for entrepreneurship. And um, well, uh, as you can see, there's you, you need like good governance, you need education, uh, you need the skills, you need the basic infrastructure. So, yes, that's that's the message. Let's let's be positive and excited, but let's keep on working on all the other aspects that we we need to to improve things in Africa. Thank you. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> let's, stay, let's stay, and now you, it's rectech fintech. Yes, 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 yes. Do you need the arguments? No, sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just being pre prepared. stand actually because okay, it's the okay. end of the day and I need okay. a bit more energy okay. I think. <laughs> so well our yeah. I think I have it. Okay, okay. I think you can hear me, yeah. Okay, great. So uh, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, uh, she's Dr. Sam Shan Shan Lewis. Uh, she's going to talk about Grand Tech and why it matters uh, ethical access related. And she's a co-founder. Okay, perfect. She's a co-founder of Rectech Associate, which is an advisory firm which sits at the co at the core of the regulatory technology market, and she helps uh, Rectech firms to to grow. 
Okay. And she's also the founder of Rectech Women, which is a professional, uh, professional women's network that uh, works for women working in regulation, law, compliance, and, and technology. And she has more than 20 years of experience working in financial regulation. She has uh, been awarded a PhD from the London School of Economics in 2017, in which she explored how regulated firms can manage regulatory ch ch change, which is uh, quite a lot, I have to say, working on the financial regulation myself. So her, her talk now is going to focus mainly on the interplay between regulation, technology innovation and ethics, using financial services as a case study. Lovely. Thank okay. you so much. I'm going to stand up because I'm, I'm feeling a bit tired and need a bit more energy at the end of the day. Um, it's probably not the best time to be talking about regulation. People's eyes tend to glaze over when, <laughs> when I start, so, so bear with me. I'm really honoured to have been invited to speak here today by Katerina. Um, I think a lot of the content that we've covered today has been very close to my heart. I'm a sociologist, um, so really understanding some of the societal impacts of the technological innovation, I think, is, is really important. Um, and I think it's important to think about it kind of consciously and critically and not just go with the flow. I mean, fintech is one area where there's a huge amount of hype, certainly in the, in the UK and in the, in the Western world. And I think we have to look at things quite critically and, and not just ke get caught up in that hype hype. Um, as Ursula kindly said, my background is financial regulation um, in particular. And I think actually looking at regulation is a really um, good example of how several of the themes that we've been talking about today come together. We've been talking about law, we've been talking about ethics, we've been talking about business and innovation. And I think they, they really do um, come together, particularly when we're talking about financial services. Um, so I think there's there's three main ways in which these concepts uh, interact. So there are the responses of the regulators and the policy makers to technological innovation. Um, do their current rules and frameworks adequately manage the harms, the risks and the uncertainties um, associated with new types of technology? Um, Regulators themselves are experimenting with this technology to help to see whether it helps them do their work and, and exercise their regulatory and supervisory mandates um, more effectively. And finally, which is the area that I'm working in, is the use of technology and innovative technology by regulated firms to help them meet their regulatory obligations. And I think... Um, each of these three types of interactions also have some ethical dimensions, which I hope to explore a little bit later. Um, I think it's worth going back to, be to first principles and really understanding what regulation is. Um, so I'm going to read out a definition from one of my favourite regulatory scholars, and I was very privileged that she was my PhD supervisor, and that's um, Professor Julia Black from the London School of Economics. And she defines regulation as a series of sustained and focused attempts to change the behavior of others in order to address a collective problem or attain an identified end or ends, usually through a combination of rules or norms and some means for their implementation and enforcement, which can be legal or non-legal. And the key thing to pick out there, I think, is this focused attempt to change behaviour. Regulation is all about changing behaviour. And particularly in financial markets, there are three main objectives for, for regulation. So it's perfecting those markets. There's often information asymmetry between those providing financial services and those consuming financial services. It's also about managing risk, managing uncertainty. Um, the global financial crisis was clearly um, a good example of a huge amount of risk and instability. And then the third thing is about upholding rights and values. It's about upholding the levels of trust between consumers of financial products and those providing them. It's about ensuring there's fairness in those markets, that customers are treated fairly. Um, and it's about having a reliable, a reliable financial system that we can have trust and confidence in. So thinking first about regulation and technological innovation, um, Innovation isn't new, um, which sounds a bit like an oxymoron, but it's not. There have been many types of innovation that regulation has, has had to keep up with. Um, and when it doesn't keep up with that kind of innovation, there are often 
quite serious consequences. Um, one example outside of financial services is the is the deep rise in oil spill, where there was deep under under seabed drilling for oil, and this was a technology that the the existing regulatory framework couldn't keep up with um, and didn't really recognise. And, and so the, the disaster happened because the regulation, the health and safety regulation, the engineering regulation just wasn't keeping in sync with the types of um, innovation in the industry. So regulators need to understand the risk of new innovations and ensure that they have a framework for that's suitable for dealing with these rules. And they also need to uphold the values. So one of the things that we spoke about earlier today was this idea of privacy and data privacy being a new human right. And that is a value that I think regulators need to uphold. So they need to understand whether the current regulation is sufficient for, regula for regulating these technological innovations. Does the regulatory perimeter adequately capture new risks, new types of harm? Um, a good example is the one being discussed in the room back there, which is cryptocurrency and crypto assets. Um, and there's huge variety globally in terms of how regulators are responding. You know, Malta is going, yes, this is brilliant for our economy. And then in other economies, particularly some of the um, more developing economies like Algeria and Egypt, is out, there's an outright ban. And this is because we don't yet understand the implications of this, this technology. Um, there's also a way that regulators are engaging with this type of in innovation and the Financial Conduct Authority and many other regulators throughout the world have this concept of a sandbox, which is a safe space for um, new technology, fintechs, new business models, new ways of offering products and services to customers can be tested in a safe environment where the risks are mitigated and it gives the regulators who are running these sandboxes an opportunity to really understand that technology and whether the existing frameworks they have are adequate. We do need to think about the ethical impacts. And I think fintech is a really good example. We've talked about some of the opportunities, but also some of the negative aspects. And I think when you start seeing large firms like Google, who have just announced that they're going into banking, the Facebook Libra coin, um, we really need to understand how this kind of tech bro VC investment mentality, how that actually really fits in with the provision of financial services. Um, you know, there's a, this culture of unicorns and, and VC investment, but really how does that play out in terms of trust and culture and all of those things that just because you're seeking technology, you might not think about. So I think there's some ethical implications to fintech, to these new, new technologies. But obviously there's opportunity and there's opportunity for regulators to use these new technologies and to rethink regulation itself. Um, so in New Zealand, there's recently been an experiment which is about creating regulation as code, creating law as machine executable and readable code. Um, so they ran a three week discovery process and over the course of that, those three weeks, they rewrote two sets of legislation as software code. Um, which means that that code is immediately understandable by, by machines. Now, if there are any lawyers in the room, I can imagine that you're worrying a little bit now about the, <laughs> the idea of, of law being created into something so binary and black and white, um, which I definitely think is, a, is an issue. And the idea of um, using regulation as code creates all sorts of other ethical impacts. Where does the liability lie? Who's actually responsible for that? that code? Is it the banks that are implementing it through their systems? Is it the regulators? Um, what if there's an error? Um, is the regulator skilled enough to actually write and interpret regulation as code? There are so many issues around this. I could go on and if I was to do another PhD, I think it would be <laughs> exploring that, but I don't really have the time. Um, and then the final the final interaction is the use of regulatory technology by regulated firms. And I really do think that this is an area where there is a huge opportunity to help um, the financial system be more safe, be more compliant. Um, 
so in my day job, I do a lot of research into the reg tech market, and we found over a thousand products globally that are trying to um, help financial institutions deal better with their regulatory obligations across a whole number of different use cases. Um, but the one that I want to highlight is about fighting financial crime. And we heard earlier about some of the really dreadful um, cyber crimes that are perpetuated. And one of the reasons that I'm bringing that up is a lot of the illicit flows that are the result of those types of crimes are channeled through our legitimate financial system. And it's a clear case where we could do more to identify and catch sophisticated criminals who are using all of this digital, digital technology in the same way that we are, but for nefarious purposes. So technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning have the ability to um, look at human data, that's, look at data that's beyond a human scale and identify new patterns of financial crime so that we can actually improve the level of prosecution. Um, figures from Europol suggest that whilst levels of suspicious activity reporting are increasing year on year, only about 10% of those reports lead to further investigation and only about 1% of the criminal proceeds in the, U in the EU are ultimately confiscated. There's a huge amount more work that we need to do and I think it's always really important to think about the human harm that sits behind some of these, um, these awful crimes and the, and the regulation to, to stop them. Um, but I do think that there are some other issues in terms of using technology for compliance. And one of these is comes back to the point I made at the beginning, which is regulation is about modifying behavior. Um, you can't remove the human factor and the accountability from, from regulation and, and compliance. Um, you can't outsource this moral, moral and ethical responsibility to technology. Um, we need to make sure that all our conduct of business rules are are balanced against the use of technology. And it provides an easy mechanism for blame shifting. The computer said so, so you know that's, that's what I need to go with. It takes out that l level of human judgment, um, which we really need to keep. So I think compliance is ultimately about behavior. Um, bad behavior can be detected, um, but actually we need to think more about how it can be prevent prevented, bad behaviour can be prevented in the first place. And I don't know, even though we did hear today about something, you know, the ability for um, uh, humans, uh, machines to understand our decisions, predict our decisions even before we know what they are. I'm not sure that's going to come into, into play in financial services anytime soon, at least I hope not. Um, so in terms of the conclusions I wanted to come to today, I think Regulators will need to scrutinise the decision making that goes into the design of technology systems, the choices, the assumptions that are made. Um, and they need to do this not just in terms of uh, individual decisions, but the overall transparency and making of decisions um, as a result of using AI. I think regulators themselves in the use of new technologies must ensure that they do so in, in a way that doesn't undermine their legitimacy and democratic democratic accountability. And regulated firms need to understand and be able to demonstrate an understanding of what the technology does and doesn't do, so that compliance is embedded in, in, in the culture and people of the organization as well as the technology. So I think with innovation, there is a real risk to the integrity of the principles that underpin what makes regulation effective and democratically accountable. Um, new constellations of accountability and responsibility emerge from the reg tech ecosystem, and we need to think these through really carefully to make sure that interests and incentives are, remain aligned um, in order to maintain ethical conduct, financial stability, and the protection of consumers. Thank you very much. Can I just ask you one question? Sure. One second, may I have just to ask? Sure, you sure. You see, as this developed, I mean, don't you find the criminals are going one step ahead? Because now large drug offenders are not the you capturing from data packages that, of course, go down the optic fibers. But what they are doing is they open an inbox, they have a password, they simply give the email inbox password. 
to somebody. So mm. that person opens it. So it doesn't really, the information is not passing through the optic fiber. So how do you detect that? And now huge drug laws, you're finding there's less activity mm. now on the internet. I think, I mean, so it comes from the interaction with the financial institutions themselves. So they're using a lot of unsupervised machine learning to identify an anomalies. And they are, there's a lot more sharing of different financial crime technologies. It's like a virus that mutates, keeping up with these different types of um, financial crime. And there's a move to more sharing of that information. Um, so one bank detects a pattern that needs to be shared so all the other banks can detect that pattern. Technology is being used for that quite a lot. It's still an early stage, but they're moving towards that. Um, so the ability to identify crime from the way that people interact with the financial system um, is, is hopefully going to help us detect more of these evil people. <laughs> Great. Thanks ever so much. <laughs>